Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. We're just blessed that you can join us and pray that the Lord will bless you with His Word in this study here. Ta-da! I was going to say tonight, but you may not be watching it at night time. Oh, yeah. You can watch it later. So I'm joined by Mark and my lovely wife, Alice. Good evening. Hello. And How are you? Blessed to be joined by you. Before we start our continuation of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where this is the third part, our third part of the, that study. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to ask Mark to lead us in a prayer to get God's blessing upon our effort. Oh Lord, we just thank you for being here tonight and delving in your word. Just show us what we need to know, not only for our own good, but to preach it to others. In your name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, as I said, this is the third part. Um, We're in the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And last week we did the the first one of those Beatitudes, Blessed are the Poor in Spirit. Uh, And we we finished that up. I want to just give you one this, this one little brief recap of what we finished. And again, these Bible studies stay up on demand. So if you weren't able to see last week, if you missed it for any reason, or if you want to invite others to watch it, it's there. available here on Bible Talk so they can see it, and it'll stay up there. But just to, blessed are the poor in spirit, to put that in a sentence, it says, being poor in spirit is not about what a person has, it's about what a person considers to be his own. It all belongs to God. That's what makes you poor in spirit, and that's what will make you rich in life. The other thing I wanted to say before we start this Bible study, and I think this is important, what? Why, are we, why do we do this? Why do we gather? I mean, you can talk about a lot of reasons, and people go to Bible studies for a lot of reasons. They want to know the Word better. That sounds nice. A lot of people go to Bible studies because they just, well, they want to, they, fellowship. They want to, they want to find fellowship. They want, there is a reason that you are joined with us here tonight. Yes. Mm-hmm. There is a reason that God has us here in His Word. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to read this real, real quickly. And this is from the second letter of Peter, in the first chapter. I'm going to read from verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. See, he wants us to have knowledge. That's what he spoke to the prophet Hosea. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Praise God, that's the word. So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. The fact of the matter is the reason we're having this Bible study is so that you can become more like Jesus Christ that I become more like Jesus Christ, that Mark and Alice become more like Jesus Christ. Our gathering in the Word is it so we become more Christ-like. In the beginning, God said He would make man in His image, but then Adam sinned, and men fell away, and we stopped looking like God. We are in that place now where this Word of God is a tool that He uses to shape us and mold us and bring us back to that place where daily, more and more, we look like Jesus Christ, we act like Jesus Christ, we think like Jesus Christ. So that's why we're doing this. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. So now, as I said, we're in the third part of this study, and we're going to start, we're in Matthew chapter 5, mm-hmm. Sermon on the Mount, right, the Beatitudes, verse and four. we're in v- verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay, that's what we're studying. Now, let me just tell you what a dictionary gives as a a definition for the word mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, right? Mm -hmm. The dictionary says that to mourn, which is a verb, is to feel or express sorrow or grief. To grieve or lament for the dead. To show the conventional or usual signs of sorrow over a person's death. To feel or express sadness for the death or loss of someone or something. Mm -hmm. Right? 
So mourning is a sorrowful process, right? As a matter of fact, the antonym, the opposite of that, the dictionary says, is to laugh or rejoice. Got it? Yeah. However, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually appraised, so they don't understand things. And my question is, if God is saying that blessed are those who mourn, and at the same time He has commanded us to rejoice always, which we talked about, I think, last week at length, right? That's an oxymoron, or it would seem to be an oxymoron. How can you have this mourn and have sorrow, and at the same time, be rejoicing? Now, and I'm not, not tonight, I don't think, but probably next week, one of the things I do want to talk about is, if you're familiar with what an oxymoron is, an oxymoron is a contradiction in terms. But a paradox is a seeming contradiction in terms. They would seem to contradict, but in fact they do not. And the Bible is filled with these paradoxes. All right? And this is a paradox. That at the same time you mourn, and it is the same time, by the way, uh, that you can be comforted and be, be filled with joy and be rejoicing. So that's what I want to talk about sometime. I want to start by looking at um, mourning in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament there are many, many accounts of mourning where there is this, this weeping, this sorrow, this gnashing of teeth, this wailing, you know, throwing dust and ashes upon them, so ranting, renting, rent, 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 rending, renting their garments. Not renting out their garments. No, not renting out their garments. Okay. Write to Alice at officeofbibletalk.com. Okay. Let me just give you three examples, and there are many, many examples, but I just picked three because they're kind of foundational with Abraham. All right? In Genesis 23, verse 2, it says that Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that's Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. I mean, here's a great love story. So I can, I can surely understand why at the loss of his beloved wife, who was his wife for my goodness, years and years, decades and decades, that he would have this sense of loss and mourn for it. All right? And Aaron. Then in Numbers 20, it talks about Aaron. After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar, Aaron had died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. When all the congregation saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron for 30 days. Okay? Then later in Deuteronomy, again Moses, but this time, although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim nor his vigor abated. So the sons of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. So it was not an uncommon practice. It is a very common practice in the Old Testament for all of this morning. And it's in the New Testament. We'll talk about that in a minute, all right? But first, before I do that, a lot of firsts here, eh? I just want to put two other scripture verses out. And I'm not going to discuss these now. But I want to, I want to plant them like a seed that I hope that God will water and grow during the course of the study tonight. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. That's Psalm 30, right? And then, of course, Ecclesiastes. I'm sure you've heard this one. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. And then it goes on in verse 4 in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes to say, A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time for everything, right? Now, the Lord is saying we're blessed when we mourn, but we're not to mourn over those who will live forever, but those who risk dying forever. And if we're going to start talking about mourning and death, you know where it has to start? And by the way, there's nobody sitting at this table, and I doubt very seriously there's anybody out there that hasn't suffered Right. You know, the, the pain loss. of loss at the death of somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my mom and dad have both passed away. I understand that. You know, we've all had loved ones pass away. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, and this is just an aside, I just found out this week that I had three cousins who were like sisters to me. I mean, I grew up with as, as children, and I just found out all three of them had passed away. And, and I have a sense of loss about that. But when I talk about mourning for loss and death, and I say it has to start somewhere, you know where it starts? It starts with each one of us individually. It starts with you. If you're watching this Bible study, and you are saved, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, if you have been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, all right, you know where that began? It began with a warning. Now I want you to think about this, because I don't think we do think about this a lot, but in order for you to understand what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, you've got to get this, all right? If you're saved, you were dead. It began with a recognition of the fact that you were dead. It says in Acts 3.26, For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. You turned from your wicked ways because Jesus Christ came, the Father sent him. And then he goes on in 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God, See, there is a sorrow according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Your salvation began with a recognition that you were a sinner. Right? And I've said this to a lot of people. A lot of people get upset because of the way I preach the gospel oftentimes. Because I am utterly convinced, and if you can convince me otherwise, have a shot at it. That there's no good, with, good news without bad news. If you don't recognize that you are a sinner, you will never recognize that you need, a sal you need salvation from sin. You will never recognize you need a savior from sin. Right? Paul, that was, think about this now. I'm going to read from Ephesians. In chapter 2, verses 1 and 3 in Ephesians, Paul wrote, And you were dead in your transgressions and sins. He's talking about every one of us. But he's writing to believers now, right? And he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. So he's saying, now, you've got to understand this, to understand what this whole thing is about. Before you were saved, you were dead. Because you were separated from God. And it is not your heart stops beating, beating and your lungs stop breathing that is death. Death is separation, separation from God. When you, before you were saved, you were separated from God. At some point, you recognize that. Otherwise, you never would have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Why would you have to? Exactly. Alright? Mm -hmm. So you had this recognition of the death in your own life. Now, you may not have even seen it that way. We that's why, seen right, right. right. But that's why Paul is instructing the believers and telling them that you he were was. dead. Mm -hmm. You were walking. This is, this is, the, you know, this is the foundation of all of the fairy tales about zombies. It comes from a spiritual truth. That all of the unsaved people walking around are, are zombie-like. They're dead walking in their... The they're dead men walking. They're walking in their transgressions. So that recognition of your death, your separation from God, led you to a repentance. Repentance, now, we can talk about the Greek word being metanoia, changing your mind, but you know what repentance is? It's a mourning. Repentance is a mourning, weeping and wailing. It is, remember the de dictionary definition? It is feeling and expressing sadness over the loss. The loss of what? You didn't have a relationship with God. That was followed by resurrection. Hallelujah. Because still now, back in Ephesians, Paul continues in Ephesians in that same place in the second chapter and says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So this process was you recognized you were dead, you mourned over your own death, and then the grace of God resurrected you into new life. Okay? So salvation starts with mourning. Because until a person until a person mourns over their state of separation from God, they will never turn and accept the gift of God, the salvation that he offered through his son Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm just thinking about um, there's, there are times when there are enemies that you've talked about this, where Christians are rejoicing when the enemies fall and that we should be mourning for them uh -huh. yes. because they yes. they are separated from God. All right, we're going to talk about that. That's where that's where we're we're going to get to that in here because that's exactly right. I mean, who are we to mourn over? Um, I I get ahead of myself a little bit here, but I, I mentioned my mom died quite some time ago when, while I was unsaved. I I railed against God. I was angry with God that my mother died. She died of lung cancer. It was not, not a nice thing. I wouldn't have recognized true spirituality if I saw it. So I, quite frankly, even in retrospect, I don't know what my mother's relationship was with the Lord. I don't know where she came to at that, at that place. So do I mourn her? Well, I, I, I will tell you that I mourned at the time. But it was an, it was an ungodly mourning. It was just, it was, I'm going to tell you the truth. My mourning was about my loss. Right. And that's my mourning was self-centered. It was selfish. It was about right. me. Right. A number of years later, my dad passed away unexpectedly suddenly. But at that time, I was saved. Mm -hmm. And he had just gotten saved. Right. And, and I've shared this story before, so I won't go into the whole thing, but I will tell you that I was in a prayer meeting with a number of people, a couple hundred people, when I got news that my dad had passed away, and when I shared that with them, they all went, oh, and which is a mourning. Yeah. Right. And I said, stop. I said, stop. There's no need to mourn. He just got saved. He's gone. Pow, zoom. He is present with the Lord. And there was and, joy. And there was joy. So now all of a sudden... What would have been mourning is turned into joy. God comforted me about my father. I was comforted to know that he was not dead at all. He was alive. Oh yeah, the body was still here. You want to know something? I, I am not deathly afraid of losing this body. Because this is, you know, it says when the, when the perishable puts on the imperishable. I happen to know that this body is very perishable. <laughs> You know what, when you talked about your mom, and we didn't know at the time whether or not she was or had right. saved, but the comfort that we have and the joy is knowing that she couldn't leave until yeah, right. Right. she had the opportunity. Right. So somewhere before she died, the opportunity for her to yes. accept Jesus was yes. presented to her. And the, the, the other thing, and I'm just throwing this as an aside, one of the things that has comforted me uh, a lot of times in these kinds of dealings is to really understand that as much as I love my mother, for example, mm -hmm. I know that the Lord loved her, I mean, immeasurably more, okay? And that's important to understand. And let me just say it just for listen. Missing someone is not mourning. No. Oh, no, no. No, so, not at all. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to make yeah. sure that okay. people understood that. All right. So, but it is this process of, of recognition, repentance, and resurrection. Okay, so it starts with mourning and ends with joy. It ends with comfort. A couple more verses here. Back in Ephesians, in the first chapter, Ephesians one seven, it says, "In Him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace." Then in John sixteen twenty, it says, "Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament." But the world will rejoice. He's talking about when he leaves. He's talking about, he is foretelling. He's telling the disciples about his destiny to go to the cross, which is just before him. And he, when it comes to that, he says, you're going to mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, 
but your grief, it says in verse 20, will be turned into joy. All right? All of this boils down to, in a sense, one verse that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, he says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Jesus Christ conquered death. For who? For whoever. <laughs> you know, this is the verse, John 3, 16, you all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever. So what we're, what we're talking about is the power where there is victory over death, where death has been conquered because of Jesus Christ. And whoever, of all of those people, it happened to me, it happened to Alice, it happened to Mark, I, you know, it, may, it happened to you, that at some point in time, we are that whoever that accepted this free gift of God. And he took us out of death and into life. Death was conquered. So now people say, you know, I, if you know my some of my testimony, I've been run over by a truck, I've been had my life threatened, and you know, people say, are you afraid of, are you afraid of, afraid of what? Afraid of death? I already took care of that. It wasn't so terrible. Been there, done that. Yeah. I, you know, I got hit by a truck. I was dead. What could it do to me? Because when I got saved, I died and my life became hidden in Christ Jesus. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you came out of natural, you, I mean, you came out of death and into life. And then you died and came into life in Christ Jesus. Your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. This is true life. Jesus said, you know, whoever believes in me shall never die. So yeah, I died. It wasn't so bad. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of Mark Twain. Mark Twain, there was a time when a major newspaper here in the United States uh, ran an obituary of Mark Twain. A bit prematurely, because he wrote to them and said, the uh, reports of my death are exaggerated. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, so if we don't have to mourn for ourselves, and this is, this is the point. For the, for the family of God, we have died. It says it is appointed unto man to die once, then the judgment. We've died and our life is in the grave. We don't have to face death anymore. So then who should we mourn for? We should mourn for the lost. Those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're the ones who are dead. Yeah, they're still walking about. And they're still going into the stores and buying stuff. They're still going nine to five or whatever to their job places. But they are dead. And we should be mourning over them. That's the deal. Watch out. <coughs> Salud. Agua. Agua. All right. Who should we mourn for? I said at the beginning of the study, our purpose of the study is to become Christ-like. So I want to read to you from Luke 19, starting at verse 41. When he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. He said, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. <clears throat> He's mourning over Jerusalem because they had rejected him. We're supposed to mourn for the lost, all right? We mourn the walking dead, for only they have the possibility of coming to life. We've already got life, but once they're gone, they're gone. Why do you think there's an imperative to reach these people today with the Word of God? You know the account of Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and the yes. rich man who had died? Mm -hmm. I, I just give you a couple of parts of that. It's the, the account of this is in Luke 16. All right? I'm, I'm sorry. Could you just say what that last verse was? Luke 19? 19, 19, 41 to 44. Okay. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. So the account goes on to talk about, this is like a parable, that he died, and he went to the place you don't want to go. 
because he didn't have a relationship with God. Right? Mm -hmm. He had all this joy, he had all this, he had all this stuff in the world. But when he died, he went to the pit. Okay, so now he's crying out to this Lazarus for help, right? Mm -hmm. And Lazarus, Abraham, says to him, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. That's Luke 16. I read verses 19 and 26. Once a person's gone, I'm talking about physically, it's over. All right? Both death and life are eternal, and they're irreversible. This is why we need to mourn the lost now and do something about it, take action. Right? Let me just talk about New Testament mourning. I talked about Old Testament mourning. Well, what about when you get into the New Testament? Is there the same kind of mourning? Yes, there was. But listen to this, but not by the church. By, by the world, by religious people, absolutely. I'll just give you a couple of accounts, right? In Mark chapter 5, there's the account of Jesus. It says one of, the, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up. And on seeing him, Jesus, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the way to Jairus' house, you know, this is where he has the encounter with the woman who had had the hemorrhage for 12 years. She rushes up and grabs the hem of his garment. You, you all know this. Uh, again, you can go look at it in Mark chapter 5. So there's an interruption, so to speak. By the way, the Lord is never interrupted. No. And he always shows up on time. There's an appointed time for everything. But the fact is, so now he, he deals with this woman. And somebody comes running from Jairus' house. And he said, and this is Mark 5.35, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? So this little girl that Jesus was going to the house to heal, he gets a report that she's dead. But he keeps on going. So when he gets to the house, Mark 5.38, it says, he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. What are they weeping and wailing? They are mourning the loss of this young girl. Now, does that seem unreasonable? You'd say, you say it doesn't sound unreasonable, but I, and it doesn't sound unreasonable. However, Jesus Christ didn't join the morning, did he? What did Jesus Christ do? He rebuked him. It says, and then taking up the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. Jesus Christ didn't go and mourn. Jesus Christ went and changed the situation. Jesus Christ took that death and brought life into that situation. That, now, that's the plan of God. Why is it the plan of God? Because he desires, the Father desires that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. And he said to them, he said to them, why are you making a commotion? Why are you making a commotion? Yeah, their mourning was a commotion to yeah, Jesus Christ. Right. All right? The mourning of, of, of people in the world, I mean, whether it's religious people or worldly people, religious people, mm -hmm. is sympathy. And it's powerless. Mm -hmm. The comfort of Jesus Christ is the power of life. You got Remember, death has been conquered. Jesus does not sound at all sympathetic talking to one who he said would follow him. Remember this? A, a man came to him and said, I want to follow you. And here's what Jesus said. Okay, But the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. When he says bury, he's not just going there. He's not going to pick up the shovel and no, dig. No. He's going there to mourn. He's going there to participate in this burial ceremony that involves mourning and, and all of the trappings of death. And what does Jesus Christ say to him? Follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. That's Matthew 8, 21 and 22. That sounds harsh. But it's not harsh. 
Because you want to know something? There's nothing you can do for those who are gone. It's irreversible. Either they have gone to, they, either they had already accepted life and they're still alive, or they have rejected life and they are permanently dead and beyond reaching. Thus the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And David got it. He understood it. When his what? child died, he was mourning. Until, the child. until yeah. the child died. Until yes. the child died. When the child died, then and he was stopped just mourning, stopped yes. mourning and okay. went on with his life. Okay. So, um, it's not sympathy that the Lord offers, right? It's, it's life to whoever will receive it. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't go to a funeral ceremony, although I'm not a fan of funeral ceremonies. And the only time I go to a funeral ceremony is to bring at least the words of eternal life. And you can't do anything for the, for the person. In, uh, you know, this, I don't mean to sound unsympathetic or harsh. There's not a thing in the world you can do for the person in the box. Yes, can you comfort those who need comforting? Left behind. Who have been left behind? Absolutely. I have, as a minister of the gospel, I have done a couple of funeral services, conducted a couple of funeral services. Uh, I remember one we did for a, a lady that had been involved in our church for years, just a lovely, wonderful, spiritual person. And she was just well known in the county. When At her funeral service, the, the, the place was absolutely mobbed with people. Now, interestingly enough, she and I had planned her funeral service ahead of time. Celebration. We planned a celebration. And she, because she was in a hospital, she died of pancreatic cancer. Not a pleasant thing. But through it all, she was strong in the Lord and strength of his might. And she and I planned her funeral service. And when we did that funeral, or I did that funeral service, the funeral the, the director and the guy that owned the funeral home said he had never seen anything like that. Because you know what it was? It was not, it was not mourning. It was a celebration of life. It, and it was a celebration of life. Did it pain? I promise you. I mean, her husband is a dear brother in the Lord, and he still feels the, the, the loss of her, you know, of her separation, without doubt. I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, they'll be restored. Yes. They will be brought back together. And they will be brought back together. I, I want to just say this one more time, because I know that this is a real... Listen, I said that the study of the Sermon on the Mount is about reality. Yes. This is relevant. It's about the real things that go on in our life day by day. This is not about what takes place in a church building on Sundays, or not just about that. This is about the realities of life. And when I got saved, Alice and I have been married for a long time now. This, <laughs> you're not going to give a month and a day and a week? We've been married for 44 years. I don't know what day it is. That's my problem. I lose track of days. We've been married for 44 years and four months. A couple days shy of a couple days shy of that. And I love Alice. I love Alice a lot. Yes. And, you know, one of the questions that arose in the counseling I've done and the teaching I've done is, well, what happens after you die? Are you still married? Listen, this is a question that people brought to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. Because it's a concern. You know, I said, if, if heaven means being separated for, from Alice, it makes it a lot less attractive to me. I'm, I'm being real here. I'm not, you know, this is, like I said, this is not a game. I, I, Knowing that you have eternal life. Right. I, I, eternal life without her is, is it life? I mean, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, that would bother me. That thought bothers me. So I went to the Lord. I mean, I really, I went to the Lord and said, you know, I need to know. I need to understand this. I need to have a better understanding of this. And I just want to tell you what the Lord showed me. I love Alice a lot. But as much as I love her, my love for her is imperfect. I want to zoom in on this. Because it's important. I love Alice a lot, but my no matter how much I love her, and and when I know something after all those forty four years and four months of marriage, my love for her grows. But my love for her is imperfect. But when I reach heaven, the imperfect will pass away, and I will have what is perfect. So whatever you call it when we get to heaven. Alice will be there, and I will be there, and my love for her will finally be perfect. And her love for me will be perfect. You can call it what you want, but I'm looking forward to it. That's why you know, most, most Christians are not looking forward to this thing that the world calls death. That's a fact. I know that to be a fact. 
Why is it then that Paul had this attitude that to live as Christ, to die as gain? That there is indeed something better waiting for us. That Jesus Christ said, you know, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place. That the true, I mean, this true peace and joy that we have is, is not based on, we live in a world that is filled with trials and troubles and tribulations. You know, some of the old, old, uh, the old, some of the old Negro hymns from back in the slave days are so beautiful because they didn't have anything in the world. So they looked forward to the promise of what lay ahead for them, the ones who knew Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I just talked about that funeral. Alice and I sang a song at the request of, of Dixie, who died. It was, and the song is, I am a poor wayfaring stranger. And it's about, hey, you know, things aren't great here, but we're going. We're going to cross that Jordan into the promised land. So that's something to look forward to. That should comfort you, because God is a God of comfort. In the midst of mourning, in all the stuff going around, we should have that comfort. All right. So anyhow, I was talking about sympathy, right? Yes. Uh, sympathy there's a difference powerless. Yes, there's a difference between sympathy and, and true comfort, mm -hmm. okay? Job, you know the story, the account of Job, in the book of Job, he had three friends. And his, you know what his three friends were? They were sympathizers. But in fact, that never made anything better. No. Just made it worse and worse and worse. Until this man called Elihu, a young man called Elihu, showed up with the word of God. And boy, he sucks Job with the word of God. And hearing the word of God, that prepares him from hearing the word from Job, from Elihu, that he begins to hear the word from God. And that changes everything. Years and years ago, I, I know what my human nature is. I said to Alice, you know, when I, I used to, if, I have been, I've not been, I'm, I'm bouncing around here. I haven't been sick. I think I've been sick. I don't say this bragging because that gets me in trouble if I do. It gets me in trouble with the Lord. But I don't think I've been sick more than a couple of times in the 35 years that I've been saved. I'm hit, being hit by a truck and stuff like that, that's, that's not sick, all right? Flus or... Yeah, flus or anything. I don't... I, and I, I can tell you, I don't think that I have missed but two days of ministering the gospel in 35 years from being sick. And I, I surely remember one time that happened when I was bragging about not getting sick. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, the Lord had to deal with me on that. But it was my nature that if I didn't feel good, I wanted to lay in bed. You wanted sympathy. And I wanted sympathy. I wanted Alice to come up and say, Oh, poor baby. Oh, poor baby. You want a cup of hot chocolate? That's my human nature. So I, I instructed her. I told her. I gave her permission. I commanded her, I asked her, I pleaded with her, if you see me being sick, and I start with these poor me's and saying, oh, and, you know, I want you to go and say, poor baby, I said, I want you to walk up to me, I want you to look at me with those gentle, loving eyes, and say to me, rise and be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't want sympathy. I want the word of God that has power to change things. I want the word of God that brings life into situations. I don't want sympathy, and you shouldn't want sympathy either. It doesn't do anything but coddle the flesh and help the flesh grow stronger. And that's what wants it, is the flesh. The flesh. So our mourning is not about sympathy. Our mourning is about bringing the eternal, life-giving word of God into every situation. Elihu, by the way, remember, he listened to these sympathizers, talk to Job. Really, they're, they're there to sympathize, but they're tearing him down and tearing him down. And Elihu said, For I am full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. Behold, my belly is like unvented wine, like new wineskins. It's about to burst. Let me speak that I might get relief. Let me open my lips and answer. Let me now be partial to no one, nor flatter any man. For I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. I wish that each of us Christians was like that, filled with the Word of God, that if we, if we tried to constrain it, we tried to keep it in, when God wants it to burst forth, we feel like we're going we're, we're gonna to burst right out of us. What's our attitude towards death and life? Jesus said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, right? when he went there, to Lazarus, 
who is four days dead in the tomb. Did he go to did he go to mourn? No. No, he did not go to see Lazarus to mourn. And he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. That's John eleven twenty five. Let me say it again. Jesus Christ comes to bring life. All right? Sympathy builds up the flesh. The morning we're supposed to do is to bring in the Word of God to bring eternal life, to change mourning into comfort, to change mourning into joy. That's the heart, that's the mind of God. Now, the morning that the Lord blesses us with, by the way, can coexist with joy. Yes. You can mourn and feel the loss of somebody, but at the same time have the joy, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's, it, that is the heart of the Father. Mm -hmm. right? The heart of the Father. Peter said that the, heart of our, the Father does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's to come to light. Right? It's the heart of the Father, it's the mind of Christ. Because Jesus said, or it's said of Jesus, right? He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. This is Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Remember, he is mourning at the gates of Jerusalem. But mourning for what? People walking around. Walking but who are spiritually dead, the walking dead. The shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance. Now he's not talking, we didn't get nailed to a cross. But part of the sufferings we should have is this, this mourning for the lost. Okay? So also our comfort is abundant through Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.5 The mind of Christ is light. The heart of the Father is to reach out to the lost. This is why he sent Jesus Christ into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, it's interesting that the, the verse of Jesus wept, you say, it's the shortest verse. And in 1 Thessalonians um, 5, 16, rejoice always is a verse. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we talked about that. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty neat, yeah. Um, Jesus wept, rejoice always. Yeah, that's a... Two two-word verses, yeah. yeah. And they, they coexist. They're a paradox. That's, yeah. that's, that's a paradox, that's which a paradox. we will talk about, yes. right? So, Paul, who was bold enough to say that we should imitate him even as he imitated Christ, he said, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have, listen to this now, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. That's Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. He is talking about those Jews, those Israelites, who have rejected the promised Messiah of Israel. They have rejected the life that was there to be given by Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying he, that I, he has great sorrow and unceasing grief in his heart. And yet, Paul said he walked always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Paul is the one who wrote about the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the churches in, in, in Galatia and said, you know, that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So this is that paradox where the two things coexist when they seem totally opposite. But this should be our heart. You see, if, it's, if it said, blessed are those who mourn, this should be the attitude of the church. Our mourning has to be, our mourning, blessed are those who mourn. Mm -hmm. But our mourning has to be active. It has to be alive. How did Jesus end this all in the Gospel of Matthew? It says, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Go therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know how you deal with mourning? 
You go out to those who are perishing, like Jesus went to that young girl. He goes out to the dead and brings life. That is the ministry of the church. And by the way, he's saying to go out, go therefore. If we mourn, he went to the gates of Jerusalem. It's not that we sit in our church buildings and wait and hope maybe we can, you know, have a... Mm, I was going to say, you know, we, we offer donuts and coffee and have a hot dog lunch to try and get people to come. That's not what it is. If you have that passion for the lost, those who are dead, if you have that heart of God the Father, we need to go out to them. We need to reach out to them. And we need to reach out to them with the Word of God. You know, in John 6, when people were walking away, disciples were walking away from Jesus Christ because His Word was too difficult. He turned to His apostles and said, What about you? Will you also leave? And Peter said, Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter would later, in his own letter, write that we are saved by the, imper the imperishable seed of the Word. We need to have enough sense of mourning for the lost, for the dying world out there, that we are willing to go out and bring those words of eternal life. I don't know that we have a heart. I don't know that the church... I, I, I can see every place that I go, and I go a lot of places, that, yeah, there's a big effort to get people into the church buildings, to make bigger, prettier congregations, that can have bigger and prettier church buildings. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a, a heart for a bigger congregation. I am talking about a heart for the lost and dying. For those people who are walking dead in their transgressions. I don't care where they go to church after that. They don't have to become a part of me. They've got to become a part of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God. You know, I shared this with a bunch of pastors in Manchester a, a, a long time ago. And I said, you know, what, the problem here, because they were looking to make a difference in the Manchester area. And I said, the problem is, you know, you want to make this difference. But what you're doing is you're trying to build your own little kingdom instead of building the kingdom of God. You've forgotten what this is about. This is not about us having a bigger congregation than the church next door to us. This is about reaching out to people. It's throwing a, throwing a life ring out to people who are drowning. It, it, it is, absolutely. Want to talk about paradox? Yeah, we've got to throw in the anchor that is our faith. Right. right. Okay. Um... <laughs> Well, Jesus is our anchor. Yeah. Anchor of our soul. Yeah. I said next week we're going to. He's the rock. We are really going to get into this and talk about the difference between oxymorons and, and a paradox. Mm -hmm. Because the, the entire Bible, in fact, is a paradox. Mm -hmm. Right? Not a pair of ducks. No. A paradox. And I, I think we're going to find that real interesting. But let, I just want to end this tonight by talking about. Let, let's go to John chapter 11. There's a thought. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Now, for those of you who know, that would be the account of Lazarus. All right? In John chapter 10, why would I say 10? I just said 11. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Right at the back, I want you to understand something. This is a family that Jesus had a close relationship yes. with. Okay? And it says, they don't, I mean, they're not treating this lightly. When they say that Jesus loved Lazarus, he had, you know, this, this bonding with him, right? In verse 4 it says, but when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Everything is about the glory of God. All right. If you know the account, you know, I'm not going to take the whole time to read the entire 11th chapter, but you should. But the thing is, Jesus waits, literally waits, purposely postpones going to Lazarus until he is certain that Lazarus is dead that Lazarus is good and dead, that Lazarus is four days dead. And he said, and the he sickness said, is not unto death. And yet, he said, and the sickness is not unto death. Nobody understood that then. Very few Christians understand that today. He, is, he also said he's dead. Yes. Yes. Because they couldn't understand it. Right. 
He said, the sickness is not unto dead. Ah, death. And then he said, oh, he's not dead. And then he turned around and said, oh, but he is. But, but, but he's, you, know, you, you understand that what's happening here is he is... He has spoken a spiritual truth. Yes. And they are operating totally in the flesh. He's appraising spiritually. Right. And they're appraising in the natural. natural. I mean, of course he's dead. He's in the tomb. He's in the tomb. They he said, okay, he's dead. That's in the natural. He's dead. He concedes the point. Right. Well, he said, <laughs> well, he, well, or, he said later on, he said to me, he's fallen asleep. Our friend Lazarus <laughs> has fallen asleep. So the apostles go with him, and they go there, and Mary comes out, and you know Martha comes out, and and they basically chide in Jesus. You know what they said? Basically, what they're saying to Jesus is, he didn't show up. Now, why did Jesus weep? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay. They're they're basically saying, where where is this sympathy that Jesus should have had? This compassion that Jesus should have had for a man that he loved. I, Martha says, if you only showed up, if, where is that? Um, if you, verse 21, right? right? Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had showed up, if you cared enough, he wouldn't have died. But Jesus knew. He said, this sickness is not unto death. And he says then, right, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. So these are Christians who we know. They understand the resurrection, but they don't understand that it starts now. When does this eternity start? When you get to heaven, when you when your body ceases to function? You, you get to into eternity. You want, when you're born again? When you're born again, you are now you now have life eternal. That's right. We are living in eternity. And eternity is not a long, long time. Eternity is the absence of time. All right? It is just it is just forever. It's beyond it's a, not something we can understand. You can have eternal death if you choose to yes. go the way of the world. You will have eternal death. Right. Which is why we should have this heart. Alice mentioned before, I uh, go in another Pinball. jump here. Pinball. But this is something we've talked about uh, in a number of occasions here. Uh, we were trying to get into Pakistan. Alice and I, when Osama bin Laden was killed by a Navy SEAL team. And, of course, that put kind of a kibosh on, at the time on us getting into Pakistan. Uh, and people were dancing in the streets, people were rejoicing, Christians were dancing in the street and rejoicing. And I said, I, I, I have a problem with this, because the Word of God says, this Word of God, that remember, is supposed to bring us to that place where we are sharing in the divine nature of God says that we are not to rejoice when our enemy falls. We should never have glee at the death of somebody. I'm not talking about the world, all right? The world, they have a, they have a different ministry, a different purpose, a different function, but we as Christians, we, if you would, why weren't you mourning? Well, you know, I said already, you can't do much after the fact. Yeah. But if you were mourning for Osama bin Laden prior to the fact, were you praying for his salvation? Did you did you mourn for Osama bin Laden? Did you mourn for I can't remember the names anymore? Uh, the guy in Korea, the guy in yeah. Iran, yeah. Saddam Hussein, Saddam, Saddam Hussein, Kim Sung Il. Yes, if you're mourning for any of these people, you have the power to do something about it. What do you have the power to do? You have the power to, if you can't reach them personally with the Word of God, you can pray for them. And and one of the prayers I like to pray, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not into teaching prayers or anything, but, you know, that, that people like that when you're praying for them, that God would surround them with people who are filled with His Spirit, filled with His Word, and will have the boldness and the confidence to confront these people with the Word, of, the eternal Word of God bringing the presence, the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place, every place, that's what it says. Why don't we have a heart for these people who are not our friends? The Sermon on the Mount says that we are to love our enemies. Yes. Love our enemies. Oh, I didn't, I didn't pray for him because he's my enemy. He was a really bad enemy. He was really not a nice guy. Of course he was not a nice guy. So is Joe Blow walking down the street who does not know Jesus Christ is as far away from God as that other person. 
we need to we need to have a heart that cries out for the lost, to win the lost, not to build our congregations, but to save their lives. The focus isn't supposed to be on us, our church, our building, our congregation. The focus is on them. We need to have that same heart that drove Jesus Christ to weep and mourn over Jerusalem because they were rejecting him. We need to, Christians, need to cry. If you're going to mourn, we should mourn when somebody dies and they have not accepted Jesus Christ because they're gone forever. But Jesus Christ came to the tomb. There were people mourning there. It says so, all right? Yes, yes. In here somewhere. Uh, 31. Okay. In verse 31 it says, And the Jews who were with her in the house, and consoling her, when consoling her, they're giving her sympathy. Right. Yes. When they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Because that's what you do. But Mary came to Jesus when she saw him and fell on his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came were also weeping. Weeping, He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Why? Because they didn't, didn't understand. understand. Why did he weep? What gives him pain? To see his children, his brothers and sisters his family, going through pain when it's not necessary. Because they didn't get it. Because they didn't get it, because they don't understand the word. That's why Jesus wept two yes. verses later. So instead of bringing sympathy to the cause here, instead of weeping and mourning with them, what did Jesus Christ do? He brought the words of life. You know what the words of life were? Lazarus, come forth. We need to go out and cry out to people with a loud voice, like Jesus did. Come forth. Come out of that pit. Come out of that miry clay. Come up and set your feet upon a rock, a rock that is higher than you. Let Jesus Christ lift you out of that place that you are, out of, that, out of those doldrums, out of that horrible world that we're living in that is so troubled, and lift you to that place of peace, and lift you to that place of eternal life. But who's going to tell them if you don't? There's an appointed time for every event. That's what it said, right? There's an appointed... But the Word of God says, I think in 2 Corinthians, Paul, and in the letter of Hebrews, today, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts as your fathers did at Meribah. Today, we need to start crying out to people. We have to have a heart for the lost. We need to mourn. As Jesus mourned over the gates of Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, we need to mourn over the lost. And, and take it in that we have the power. We have the power to reach out to them with a hand that can take them out of death and into life with the Word of God. But we're too distracted and busy. And wrapped, up. And wrapped up with our own selves. And wrapped up with our own selves and the things that amuse us, the things that please us, the things that attract us. It's not about you. You are here for a reason. You are an ambassador. For God. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And it says that we should be pleading with them to be reconciled to God. Begging them. Begging them. That's what the Word of God says. That's what it means to mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I promise you that if you go out and start to share this good news with the lost, I promise you that you will be comforted, that you will see God respond to your actions when you go out and start to share that eternal Word of God that brings people to eternal life. You will see the dead raised. Now, you know what? Every time that somebody says yes to Jesus Christ and accepts Him as Lord and Savior, you have seen somebody raised from the dead. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what can. So, Father, I just pray that we would have a boldness to go out, that we would have a passion to go out, that we would have a burning desire to go out and share this gospel, this life-giving word with the people that we meet, the people that we encounter. Lord, that we would be faithful ambassadors for you, speaking your words, bringing that life 
bringing that light into the darkness. Give us a heart that mourns for the lost Lord. In Jesus' name. See you next time. to come.